Please stand for the reading from 1 John 4, 7 through 12. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. This is the word of the Lord. All right. Thank you, Laura. You guys have a seat. So we've been in the letter of 1 John. If you have a Bible, go ahead and open up there with me. And uh, really, we're just going to hang out there today. We're not going to do a whole lot of flipping back and forth. Um, so the letter of 1 John, right towards the end of your Bible. Um, fifth book from the end, I believe it is. And uh, we, we're calling this series Light, Life, and Love. The Apostle John loves to use these symbols in, in Scripture as he writes. Um, he loves to use really just imagery very, very, very often. Uh, imagery like light and life and love and bread and water and darkness and light and sheep and shepherds and gates and doors. Uh, John loves to use words and, and make pictures of, of kind of our faith with words. Um, he was the brother of James. And John seemed to be, as you read in the Gospels, um, he kind of seemed to be a, a guy who was particularly uh, fiery in his disposition, sort of a guy who saw the world in black and white terms, right? Like there are, there's wrong and there's right. There's good and there's bad and everything. There, there's really nothing in between, right? It's kind of how he lived. Um, there's even stories um, in the scripture where there was a time that he and his brother tried to call down fire from heaven on some Samaritans who were not treating the disciples very well. And um, some think that that maybe is where Jesus gave him and his brother the nickname. Anybody know their nickname? Sons of Thunder. Yeah, the Sons of Thunder. John was one of those guys. In Mark chapter 3, um, he was called the, a Son of Thunder. That's, that's who he was. It just meant like you're a guy with this kind of fiery disposition. Somebody is sort of a, a hothead a little bit. Anybody know somebody like that? None of y'all are like that. I know. Um, just kind of have these anger issues a little bit. But that's, that's who John was. Um, he was just a guy that was passionate, right? He was just passionate about what he believed. He was passionate about what he knew to be right and to be wrong. And if something kind of crossed the line, about what he believed, he was quick to kind of let it be known. And so um, there, there was another time in Mark chapter 9 where um, John confesses to Jesus that there was a guy who was trying to cast out a demon out of a young boy. Um, but this guy wasn't one of the 12 disciples. And so John and the others, but John kind of is the one who confesses that. He says, we, we, we rebuked that guy. We told that guy to stop doing that um, because he wasn't one of the 12. And um, so you, again, you just sort of see John's attitude in that. Like he just kind of had this sort of hardcore, like, you're not one of us. You're, if you're not for us, you're against us. You're not one of Jesus's followers. You can't do that. Um, and Jesus actually gets on to him for that. Um, and, and so it's just interesting to me that that's the guy, the son of thunder, one of the sons of thunder, who actually later becomes known as the apostle of love. That he goes from being this guy who's just sort of hard and, and, and steadfast in the way that he just um, saw the world so, so black and white and was just quick maybe to, to anger and quick to judge to being a guy who was called the apostle of love. And in fact, as he writes this letter, 1 John, he uses the word love over 40 times in this letter. This is probably the most common theme of the entire letter as you read through 1 John. Again, light, life, and love, but love really being the most prevalent application of the things that he's teaching in this letter to the church, to the disciples, because again, as I was talking about last week, this letter is written to help us understand what it really means to be a Christian. Do I or do I not know Jesus? Do I have life? Am I walking in his light? Two weeks ago, we talked about what that, like walking in the light of Christ is to live a life of holiness, and truth as he is. And then last week to, to receive his life and then live it out in obedience. And then this week is really, again, kind of the most outward expression of that is that how, how is my life going to look? What is my life going to be like if I'm actually a disciple of Jesus? And John's answer is 
it will be a life of love. You are going to live, as a Christian, you're going to live a life of love. There's really no two ways about that. And I love that John is still, he really is still kind of a black and white guy. He really is still like, there's a wrong and there's a right. There's a way to do things and a way to not do things. And he's so clear in his, in his letter right here to just say, if you don't love, then you don't know God. You're not a disciple of Jesus because he is love. And so let's, let's read this again. 1 John 4, verse 7. Dear friends, let us love one another. For love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Um, And so verses seven and eight there, he's just, again, just to recap that, he's saying, if you want to know if you know God, you ask yourself this question, do I live a life of love? You cannot not live a life of love if you know God, because why? God is love. Love. First John 4, 8. Memorize that verse. If you don't love, you don't know God because God is love. That's who he is. It's his nature. It's his essence. You ever think about that? It's such a deep thing to say. John is, is very straightforward in his writing, but he's also so deep and thoughtful. If you really kind of slow down and read John's gospel and John's letters, there's so much to unpack there. But just thinking about the fact that God is love. You ever think about that in the Trinitarian nature of God? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. How can God be love? He is love. Not just he does love. Not just that. Not just he shows love. He does. But he also is love. That's his nature because he is three in one. You can't be love if you're not three in one. The Father from all time has loved the Son and the Spirit. The Son from all time has loved the Father and the Spirit. The Spirit from all time has loved the Father and the Son. Trinity, triunity, loving one another perfectly for all time. That's how he is love. It's his essence, his nature. And so he emanates in all that he does from his very being, love. God cannot act out of, like, like without loving. He can't do that because he is love. And you say, well, well, there's parts of scripture that teach very clearly that God has wrath. And God, absolutely he does. It doesn't mean that he's not still love. And, and you know this, actually, that, like there can't be wrath if there's not love. Like those of you that love somebody deeply, is there not a side of you that has a wrath because you love that person deeply and you could show your wrath if somebody were to hurt that person that you love deeply, that your wrath would be actually a part of the intrinsic love that you feel for that person. And so God is no different. God loves himself. He, from all time, he has loved himself, his son, his spirit, his, his, the father, loving like all of that, loving one another from all time. And then he creates people to pour out that love to. And those people are to know him and walk with him and follow him and glorify him and love him as well. And then he sees the sin that we live in, right? And the sin that impugns his glory and, and, and hurts one another. Do you not think that would incur then the wrath of God to see his love pushed aside, his commandments and his truth and his light cast aside so that we could do what we want. Of course, God has wrath, but God is love. It never says God is wrath. It says he has it, but he is love. That's who he is from his very nature. God loves to express that love. And it is said in verse nine, right? That this love was shown. This is how his love was shown into the world. God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. So again, God doesn't just like, he's he's not just love, but he wants to display this love. And as we've walked through 1 John, we've seen that Jesus, God is light and Jesus is the light revealed to the world. God is life and Jesus is the life revealed to the world. And God is love. And so Jesus is the love Revealed to the world. Jesus is the love of God manifested, shown to the world because God wants us to know what his love is like. He wants us to see it and understand it and experience it for ourselves. God is not withholding 
in his love. God wants to, he desires to pour it out on the world. And he has. Verse 10, how has he done that? This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. And he sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And so what I want to do first, as as we get to verse 11, he's going to say, since God so loved us, and I'm calling this message today, so loved, and we'll get to that in a second, but since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. But first we need to know, how did God so love us, right? Like, what did that mean? That word so in, in verse 11, it's not really a word of quantity. It's not like God loved us this big, exactly. It's more about quality. This is the way. That word so means in this way, God has loved us. So what do we need to do? We need to look at verse 10 and ask ourselves this question. What way? How did God love me? What did he do? How did God display his love for me? Because again, it's, it's, it's easy for us in the world that we live in to kind of make up our own definitions of love, isn't it? Um, and in fact, our world has a saying, love is love. Like that's a saying in our world. Love is love. Y'all, that doesn't even make sense. Like I can say that about anything. Carrots are carrots. Like that doesn't, that's just, that doesn't mean anything, right? We need to ask the question, no, no, no. Like what does God say about if he is love? Guess what? He gets to define it. He gets to tell us what it is and how it should look. So let's look at verse 10. How did God love us? There's three points under this. How does God show his love? Number one, he loved us first. How did God do that? Because if God so loved us, we should love one another. So let's ask, God, how did you do it? Number one, he, he loved us first. His love was preemptive. That because God is love, it means his love is not dependent upon us or anything we have done or could ever do. We didn't earn the love of God. God doesn't love you because you're lovable. God loves you because he's love. Do you get that? That they, there's a difference. I'm not saying you're not lovable because I, I, you guys are so lovable. I know you are, right? But the fact that God's love for us is not based on what we do or don't do. God's love for us is not based on whether or not we perform for him. I had a student one time in youth ministry that just said, you know what? I kind of figured out I can't impress God. And I was like, that is such a poignant thing to say because you really can't. He's God. You can't impress him. He doesn't love you because you're impressive. He loves you because he's love. He loved us first. God, he, he, God loved you before you were born. He loved you before he ever created you. He knew you and would love you from all eternity. God so loved the world. It's true. And that's good news, right? Because no, you can't earn it, but you also can't lose it. If God's love, that's just who he is. It, it emanates from his nature. That's how he loves. So he loved us first. Number two, how did God love us? He gave his best. He gave us his very best. What is the very best that God could possibly give us? His son. What did he say in verse 10? This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. So he loved us first. Number two, and sent his son. It's the best thing God could do for you. Of all the things, and and the Bible is full of uh, verses that say that God is rich. God is wealthy. God has the cattle on a thousand hills, right? He is rich in mercy and grace and everything. He is all uh, consuming and all satisfying and all supplying. God has everything because he created everything. He could give you whatever it would please him to give you, but there's nothing better that he could give us than his own son. How did he love us? gave us Jesus. Of all the things, there's two different kinds of of ways we think about grace, God's grace. And I sort of define grace as just anything that God gives us, right? That's grace. We, we, We have earned nothing from God. He's not obligated to give us anything, but he does. And because he gives, he's gracious, right? And there's two kinds of that grace. There's common grace, There's common grace, and then that common grace is what everybody in the world experiences. Whether you love God or not, whether you follow Jesus or not, you have breath in your lungs. You can listen to music and have relationships and eat good food and enjoy a sunset. That's God's love that you can experience whether you care about him or not. That's common grace. But then there's, people have different names for it. I would just call it uh, revelatory grace. And that's the revelation of Jesus to us. Like his grace revealed to us in Christ. That's another kind of grace, a specific and special grace that we receive. Not because we earn it, because we see Jesus and we love him and he has given us Christ. But here's the, here's the question. Why? 
Why did he give us Jesus? And that's number three. So number one, he loved us first. Number two, he gave his best. Number three, he removed obstacles. Why did he give us Jesus? To remove obstacles between us and him. This was God's goal in his love, giving us Christ to remove the obstacles. There were two obstacles, two big obstacles between you and God. What were those obstacles? Think about this for a second. What were the obstacles between you and God, knowing him, having a relationship with him? Your sin and his wrath. We just talked about that. Does God have wrath? Absolutely he does. And because God is love, he's also just, he's also good, he's also righteous. And that's great news that God is good. It's great news that God is holy, that he's light. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. That's great news, but it's also the worst news in the world for sinners. Because he's light, He's holy. He's perfect. He cannot be in the presence of darkness. And we walk around in darkness in our sinfulness. That's a big obstacle between us and him. So those two barriers are my sin, my turning away from him, my refusing to love him back, my walking in my own ways, doing my own things, and the wrath that he has to pour out on sin. It is absolutely necessary that God would judge sin. He can't be a good God. He can't be a righteous God if he doesn't punish sin. You get that? He can't be. He would stop being God if he didn't punish sin. That's a huge obstacle for us. So what did he do? How did he show us his love? Read the end of verse 10. He sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. He loved us first, he gave his best, and he removed obstacles, the barriers between us and him. He sent his son to do what? Not just teach us things, not just show us a way to live, but to actually bear upon himself our sins and God's wrath. The two things, keeping us from him. You can't know God, you can't be in relationship with God if sin remains on you. You will only incur his wrath. But because Jesus went to the cross, he bore your sins under the wrath of God Almighty to pay for that, to remove from you every obstacle between you and the Father. And all you have to do is receive it by faith, to believe that that's what Jesus has done. You turn from your sin, you walk in his light and receive by faith the propitiation. Laura Laura said propitiation. Mine says atoning sacrifice. The atoning sacrifice, that's Jesus dying on the cross for your sins to bring you to God. That's how he loved us. Those three ways. Loved us first, gave gave his best, and he removed barriers, removed obstacles. So verse 11 says, dear friends, here's the the if God, then you. Okay, if God did that, here's how you love. Because this is the question. How do I walk out of here and live a life of love? Again, I don't make up the definition for myself. Love is love. Doesn't mean anything. I don't make that up. I look to God. I look to his word. I look to his example. And then I go love the way that he loved. If, since God so loved us, loved us in this way, verse 10, loved us the way verse 10 says he did, we also ought to love one another. So based on the three points we just saw about God's love, how then do we love? What what do we do? What can I do today to love other people the way that God has shown me his love? Number one is this, we love unconditionally. Because God loved us, We also ought to love one another. What is the requirement for somebody to be loved by you? What's the requirements? Is it how you feel about them? Is it what they've done or not done to you or for you? Is it your personal opinions about that person? Is it do y'all's beliefs line up with one another? Is it that your politics line up with one another? Is that 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 you have a particular feeling about them? No, none of that is what he says here. He just simply says, because God so loved you, you ought to love. Like God has shown us his love by loving us first. He didn't wait for you to reciprocate his love, did he? God didn't wait for you. He didn't ask you, show me love and then I'll love you. God just said, I love you. And so us, as as followers of him, in his example, how do we love? We love without condition. We don't base our love on how I feel or what you did. I base my love on God loved me. Look, Look at verse 19. 1 John 4, 19, we love because he first loved us. Great memory verse. Everybody should memorize that one. We love because he first loved us. Doesn't that blow up every excuse you have to not love somebody? Every one of them. You do not have an excuse. Christians, look at me. 
You don't have an excuse to hate another person. Not one excuse. I don't care who that person is. If they fall under the verse of God loved you first and so I love them, then you love them. And that's every person in the world. There's not a single human being in the world who doesn't fall into that category for you. God loved you first unconditionally. You love them without condition. There's no application process for the love of a Christian. So I love you. You know why I love you? Because God loved me first. Number two, we love generously. We love generously. God gave us what was most precious to him, his own son, his only begotten son from all eternity, his son, his light, his love, his life emanating forward in the person of his own son, his only begotten. And he gave him to the world to die on that cross, to bear his own wrath and to take away our sins, put them on his son, Jesus, to die so that we could have life. And then you and I have the audacity to be stingy with our love. That's, that's not how God loved. He loved generously. And so we must love generously. God freely gave us what was most precious to him. I'm not going to read all these verses, but they're right here. 1 John 3, 17 and 18. That says, if you see somebody who needs something, and you don't provide it for them, and you can, you have the opportunity to provide it, and you don't. He simply says this, God's love is not in you. Doesn't exist in you. James 2.16. In James 2.16, James says, if you see somebody in need, and you say, man, I'm going to pray for you. Go be well fed. I hope it works out. And you could provide for them, and you don't. He says the exact same thing. God's love's not in you. You're not a follower of God. That's not how God loves. He loves generously. And so we love generously. Galatians 5, 6 says, the only thing that matters, Paul says, is faith working itself out in love. My faith in God means I will love other people. It will reciprocate itself out. And then Luke 10, 25 through 29. Y'all know what story, or through 37. Y'all know what story that is? It's a good Samaritan. This, this guy comes and asks Jesus, um, you know, how do I have eternal life? And he says, what do you think? And the guy says, love God and love my neighbor. And Jesus is like, yeah, do that and you'll live. And the guy goes, oh, but who's my neighbor? All right? He's just trying to get the excuse going. He's trying to have a reason to not love somebody. And Jesus tells him the good Samaritan story. The Jewish guy that gets beat up and then like the church people come walking by and see him and do nothing about it. You know, maybe they said a prayer as they walked by on the other side. Hope you're doing all right, buddy. And he kept going. And then the Samaritan shows up, a guy who has no business taking care of a Jewish man. The Samaritan shows up and does what? He loves him. He, he takes care of him, picks him up, puts him on his own donkey, takes him to a, a hotel, drops him off, pays for it himself, comes back the next day, checks up. Like he loves generously. And Jesus says, who is a neighbor? And they answer, well, it's the guy that took care of him. Ding, 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 ding. That's it. You love, not because he earned it, because God loved you. And then you're just generous with love. This is Christianity, y'all. It's not rocket science. It's, man, I'm loved. I want to love people. Um, those of you who go to CR, you know this saying, hurt people, what? Hurt people. Hurt people, hurt people. That means if you've been hurt, you have a propensity to hurt others, right? I think it works exactly the same on the other side of that coin. Loved people, love people. Love people, love people. If you've been loved, you receive the love of God, the generosity of God. You will love with that same generosity. Not because anybody earned it or because you feel a certain way. Love is not a, a feeling. Agape love is not necessarily a feeling. Yes, sometimes the feelings are there and that's wonderful. And we should feel affection, I believe, for, of course, for God and for one another. But even as we look out into the world and see people that don't agree with us, don't think like us, don't want anything to do with us, whether or not the feeling is there, it's the action. Be loving. Do loving things towards others. So that's the third point. We love intentionally. We love unconditionally. We love generously. We love intentionally. And that intentionality, that's about, well, okay, as we see how God loved, again, verse 10, how did God love? He gave his son to be the atoning sacrifice. He had a purpose for his gift, didn't he? There was a reason Jesus came. It was intentional. It was thought out. 
From all the time, God thought about this. He thought about us stuck in our sin. How can I make a way? I'm going to give them my son to remove my wrath and remove their sin. And so how do we love? We love with thoughtfulness. We love with intentionality. We actually think Christianity is a thinking religion. Y'all know that, right? Like we use our brains as Christians. We think about God. How do I love today as you loved me? I want to be intentional with that. I want to have a purpose. And the main thing that we can do as Christians to love people is to love people the way Jesus did, is to show them as best we can the love of God, right? To, to make our lives a conduit for them to see God's love in us. That's the intentionality we have every day. I want people to see Jesus in me. That's my intentionality. First John 4, look at verse 12. Look at the last verse there. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. You know what that means? His love being made complete in us. It means God's love is not complete when you receive it. It's not done yet. It's complete when you receive it and reciprocate it. That's when it's done. That's the point of God's love. God's love loves to move through us. Not just to us, through us. That's how love works. And John says, it's, it's, it's per- the word's actually perfect. It's perfected then. That we felt it, we've received it, and then we give it out to others. So ask yourself this question. Is the love of God seen in the way that you treat other people? Like when people see your life, people look at you and watch you and listen to you and see what you post online See how you talk about issues in the world and and politics and see how you do your job and see how you parent and see how you are married and treat your spouse and see how you, uh, you know, do everything that you do in life. See how you use your, your money. See how you lift up the word of God or your own opinions, like which are more important to you. As they see the way we do things, what do they see? Do they see God's love in you? Is God's love being perfected in you? being completed by having been received, yes, but then being given to others. That's the point. So how do we love as God loves? We love unconditionally because he loved us first. We love generously by freely giving of ourselves because he freely gave us his son. And we love intentionally by removing the obstacles to people seeing Jesus, just like God removed obstacles from us knowing Jesus and coming to him. We want to just remove obstacles from people's way. Is your life removing obstacles or creating obstacles for people to see Jesus? That's a great question to ask ourselves. And I think we could take some time to really think through that. And so here's what we're going to do. We're, we're going to worship here in a minute. And I'm going to ask the band, y'all can go ahead and come on out. We're going to sing a couple more songs today, just because, man, I, I want us to just end up our service today, just feeling the love of God and singing the love of God and rejoicing in who he is and all that he's done for us. And we're going to take communion here in just a few minutes as well. But I want us to come back to the Apostle John real quick because really I think this is the point that I think John wants us to understand in all of this. So I just want to think about him as, as a man for a second because again, this was a guy, as we see in the Gospels, who just had sort of probably a fiery disposition about him, sort of that little bit of angst, a little bit of anger. Maybe that just comes with youthfulness or whatever it was. But how did this man go from being a son of thunder to being known later in his life as the apostle of love. Like how, what, what changed for him? You know what I'm saying? Like that, that's crazy to have those two very different nicknames. Son of thunder, dude calling down fire to rain on the Samaritans, to becoming the apostle of love. The guy who wrote 40 times in his letter that we should love one another and love others. How did, what, what, what happened in the middle? You know what happened in the middle? He experienced the love of Jesus in the middle. Five different times in his gospel, when John writes the gospel of John, he references himself, but he doesn't use his own name. You know what he calls himself? The disciple whom Jesus loved. Loved people, love people. He had experienced the love of Christ for himself He had known it. He had seen it. He had been called by Jesus, taught by Jesus, discipled by Jesus, even disciplined by Jesus. Jesus was patient with him. Jesus ate with him. Jesus served him. Jesus died for him. John's the only one recorded of the 12 disciples who was at the cross when Jesus died. He was there. He saw it happen. 
And he experienced the love of God in his life, the love of Jesus in his life. And it changed him, son of thunder, to the apostle of love. Why? Because he was loved by Jesus. And I would tell you this, all of those things that happened to John, they've happened to you. You've been called by him. You've been taught by him. You've been discipled by him. You're being discipled by Jesus, hopefully in his word, right? We're disciplined by him in his word. He's patient with us. He communes with us daily in his word and in his spirit. He serves us daily, giving and providing for us. He died for us to rescue us, to bring us to God. And he rose from the dead for you. And he intercedes right now for you. And he's keeping you secure for eternity with the Father. Because he is love. And he loves you. You're so loved by God. So loved by God. And so two questions. Have you received his love? Have you actually received that love from God in the person of Jesus Christ? And if you're a Christian, the answer is yes. If you have faith in Jesus, you've received his love. You've, 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 you've got it. You've received it. So, so live it out. And so that's the second question. If you have, are you reciprocating that love to God in worship to your brothers and sisters in Christ? Are you loving them in service and in ministry? And to the world, to the lost, are you sharing God's love as, as a witness of Jesus, sharing the gospel with people? It is not loving to withhold the good news from the world. That's not loving. It's loving to share it with your family, with your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers, the other parents at the ball field, people at school, people at work strangers, enemies? Are you loving them because you were first loved by God? And so today as we wrap up, I just want to, man, let's just consider those things. Let's consider the love of God for us and ask God the question, God, am I allowing your love to be perfected in me, to be made complete in me in the way that I show it to other people? Um, if you need prayer, for anything um, during this time, listen, you can come on down. If you're on the prayer team, I just want to invite you, just come on down here. Uh, we would love to pray for you this morning. And there may be somebody in this room too that, um, Scott said this, you may be, maybe didn't come in here planning on being baptized. We have some baptism second service. We don't have any plan for this service, but listen, if today you're like, I want to receive the love of God in Jesus, I've seen it. I believe that. And I need to be baptized to confess it. Um, you can do that this morning. You can do that right here, right now. We have extra towels. We got extra clothes. Bree is right there in the back. If you want to, walk up to her. Tell her you want to be baptized. She'll, she'll get you some clothes to change and you can come be baptized when we're done singing. If you want to receive the love of God, maybe that's just you this morning. In other words, um, we just want this, this moment, this time to be a time of worship, a time of praise, a time of thanksgiving, and a time of just receiving the love of God, however and wherever you're at in your life right now, to receive it. And then to ask God, God, how can I then begin to live it out? To your glory and for the good of others. Because you first loved us. So let's pray together and let's worship together. God, we love you because you first loved us. And so, Lord, I just ask right now that you would help us. Help us, God. Help us to receive your love. And help us to live it out with intentionality and generosity. Without condition. Just simply because you are God. And you have loved us and you have called us to live lives of love. In Jesus' name.